Professor Adil Najam, what are your expectations to the climate negotiations in Warsaw? Uh, I don't have too high expectations for Warsaw, but I do hope that the negotiations will move us forward, even if slightly forward, towards a final agreement. And by an agreement, I mean a grand agreement. I don't think, I don't see that happening in 2013, but I hope over the next one, two, three years, we will move there and Warsaw will be a good indicator of whether we are moving in the right direction or not. Do you see a chance of an international agreement in the end? I hope so. I hope so. I think the world hopes so. The world has been waiting for a very long time. Ever since the Rio uh, 92 conference, we've been waiting for a grand agreement. But let us also realize that the agreement that comes out of these negotiations, the piece of paper that everyone signs, is not really the goal. The goal is action. And in some ways, a de facto agreement is already there. Countries, we already kind of know where they stand. Some countries are already doing certain things. Other countries, we know the directions. So we do not need to wait for a formal agreement because what we should be focused on is what countries are actually doing and nudging them, pushing them, cajoling them, convincing them to move in the right direction. Pakistan's contribution to the global emission of greenhouse gases is less than 1%. Still, it has been rated of one of the most vulnerable nations to the adverse effects of climate change. What positions should countries like Pakistan take in those negotiations? This is one of the cruel twists that nature has played, not just on Pakistan, but on many, many, many developing countries, many poorer countries. Uh, it turns out that many of the countries that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are the countries that have contributed the least to producing it. And in some ways that's understandable because if you're poor, uh, you are going to be vulnerable because your ability to build the resilience will be less and you will be on marginal areas, you will be more, more, more under threat. Uh, that is the situation for a country like Pakistan. What kind of impact does climate change have on the region with regards to ecological, economical and social consequences? Uh, all countries at one level are climatically defined, but Pakistan and South Asia, I think, are particularly climatically defined. And what, what I mean by that is that if you think about Pakistan, its history, its sociology, its economics, its, its, its lifestyle, um, even its religious um, uh, rituals and stuff, they have a very huge footprint, fingerprint of the climate on that. And what I mean by that is, here is the monsoon, the grand rain, the grand rains. And they come, happen because there is the Himalayas. And that gives you the great rivers that define this country. Now, what that means is that if anything changes in any of these grand climatic forces, the country's ecology, economy, sociology gets impacted in many, many ways. It gets impacted in terms of economic issues such as food production, such as agriculture. It gets impacted because the cities are defined by the climate and cities are placed by the climate and so on and so forth. Staying with um, the impacts of climate change, what effects could it have on food security? Food is probably one of the first indicators, the first real big indicators of climatic impacts in a country like Pakistan. Pakistan is still a major agricultural country. It needs to feed a very large population, just under 200 million people. Therefore, food is a particularly important thing. And food, if you think about it in a Pakistani context, is really like packaged water. So if you start thinking food very quickly, you are thinking water because that's the key constraint. When, not just how much water there is, but also when is water there? Are there floods? Are there droughts? And therefore, the food question in Pakistan gets linked very much to the water question. And water is how climate and food gets linked in Pakistan. How will climate change affect Pakistan's already weak energy sector? I think energy is a different but an equally important case than food because energy is already a looming crisis in Pakistan. Not just looming, it's an actual crisis. There are blackouts for hours and hours and hours in just about every city in the country. So we have an energy crisis. That means we need to increase energy production, not decrease it. So there's no argument you can make that we should use less energy. The argument that needs to be made is we need to use cleaner energy. 
Now that's an opportunity, not only for the Pakistan, but for the world. That here is a country that will have to increase its energy production. Will it do it in cleaner, greener ways? That's where international cooperation can also come in. It can come in in the form of financial assistance. It can come in in the form of technological assistance. But here is the opportunity to leapfrog. And in that, it's, you know, it's like what happened when we moved from landlines to cell phones. Countries that were, had fewer landlines actually made the transition quicker. And I'm hoping that in energy, we will see a similar case, that countries can leapfrog the old, dirty technology of coal and so on and so forth and move to cleaner technology. But that will require financial assistance, that will require technological assistance. In 2010, Pakistan was hit by a flood crisis of unexpected dimension with almost 20 million people being affected. Do you think climate change is partly to blame? I think partly, but we should also not sort of read too much into it. You know, it would be wrong to say that the flood came only because of climate change. But the lesson here is nothing will ever happen only because of climate change. Climate change is not going to cause new problems as much as it is going to exacerbate existing problems. So it is going to be what, what you know people in the military call a threat multiplier. Existing problems will become bigger. Either they will become bigger in scale or they will become more frequent. The enormity of these floods, I think, was a wake-up call for Pakistan in the sense that people learned the lesson that you get into big trouble if you mess with nature. And you suddenly start realizing what the force of nature really is. Uh, so I think making a one-to-one -one correlation is scientifically wrong. But learning important lessons from disasters like that flood is extremely important. Because if you get more and more climate change, you get more and more extreme events, not only larger in size, but more frequent. And that is the challenge that countries like Pakistan need to prepare for. Have there been any consequences in the last three years to prevent such disasters in the future? I think, you know, if you look at Pakistan, part of the problem is that the country is distracted by these far more immediate problems. Uh, problems of extremism, problems of violence, problems of terrorism. And one of the impacts of that is that these longer term problems, even though climate is no longer a very long term problem, gets lesser attention. And, and that's really, really a, a tragedy because the countries that need to focus most on climate change, like Pakistan, have the least ability, the least resources to do so. Uh, that's one part of the answer. The other really important thing here is that unfortunately, because of the floods and so on and so forth, many developing countries and certainly Pakistan have started looking at climate change as a disaster issue. That when they prepare for it, they prepare for disasters. And I think we should prepare for disasters, but preventative and adaptive solutions are far more important in the long run. And I do not, unfortunately, see as much of those happening. The real challenge, again, to me, is for countries like Pakistan to think about adaptation. That is what they will have to do to climate change. And that takes a, a far greater um, focus on the long term and b, a different type of resources and see, and this is most important, it means putting climate change into your development policy, into your development decisions. How are the challenges of climate change tackled on a political level, especially after the newly elected Pakistani government shut down the Ministry of Climate Change this summer? Uh, the Ministry of Climate Change was closed partly because of constitutional change which has devolved a number of issues to the provinces. So it's not as if the Ministry of Climate Change has been closed. It is that climate change and environment has been moved to the provincial level. Uh, however, the real important thing is that for many countries, including Pakistan, the immediate problems are so intense that you really do not see a lot of government attention on climate change. I don't think it is because they're not interested. I think people have realized this is important. People have realized this is big, but people have also realized that this is long term and they are fighting battles of survival that are literally about tomorrow with violence and terrorism and so on and so forth. So all of that is distracting away from climate change right at the time when I think there is a beginning of a political understanding of climate as an issue. Uh, 
And that again is a place where the international system can help. Coming from the national level to the international level again and to the climate change conferences, should Pakistan focus on fund mechanisms more and on technology transfer? I think, as I have mentioned in the earlier ones, a number of things that Pakistan needs to do, international assistance can help, whether it's financial or technological. But first of all, for all developing countries, and all countries really, developing or industrialized, the realization has to come that this is a challenge of national priority, this is a challenge of national importance. Now, then the question is, what type of international assistance can help where? In terms of technology, I think the biggest and most important potential is in the energy area. Pakistan has to leapfrog on energy. It has to move from a dirtier system to a cleaner system. And their technology will play a bigger role. Their countries like Germany, for example, which have uh, experimented with better, cleaner technology, can play a pivotal vo role in allowing Pakistan to leapfrog. In other areas, especially adaptation, development adaptation, I think financial resources are important. And my own sense is financial resources are important not just in giving more money to environment. They are more important in giving more attention to environment in our development spending. In when we build roads, when we build infrastructure, when we build even schools. So it is not that you have to give separate money to environment or separate attention to environment. It is that you put environment at the center of the development enterprise. Pakistan and India face common challenges regarding climate change. A melting of the Himalayan glaciers, for example, will have an effect on the whole region. Are both countries willing to cooperate on these issues or will it increase the conflict of the nuclear neighbors? Here is one of the grand realities of the, the climate change world. When I travel from Pakistan to India, I need a visa, I need a passport. When pollution from my car travels from Pakistan to India, It needs nothing. The carbon dioxide molecule can go wherever it wants. And that's the nature of the climatic and the environmental problem. That's true for water. That's true for climate. That's true for uh, pollution. And therefore, the lesson is that environmental problems in general, climate problems in particular, can only be tackled at the international level at the bilateral level, at the regional level, at the global level. So I think there is an inbuilt logic of cooperation within climate change. And my hope is that climate change is going to bring these countries together to do a little few more things together rather than break them apart. I don't think countries will go to war over climate change because it happens too slowly. I think it is much more likely, I hope it is much more likely, that countries will see the logic of cooperation. For example, on issues of water. For example, on issues of industrial policy, industrial location, and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, on the issues of glaciers and the management of glaciers. So therefore, countries, and it's not just India, Pakistan, it's India, Pakistan, China, Nepal, who share the same mountain range. And therefore, I think the logic of cooperation will trump the logic of competition and conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you.